God for your willingness to use your gifts. The Lord be with you. And also with you. It is great for me to look out from here and see you all out there. Uh, I thought maybe the rain would keep somebody home, or for those who are really serious about preparing for the Super Bowl, <laughs> even though it's six hours away from now, but uh, I'm glad that, uh, that you were willing to come and to be part of this year. So first of all, if there are any visitors to the house, we'd especially like to welcome you. Uh, if you are kind enough to gently raise your hand, we gently will give you a package of material that uh, helps you better understand who we are. So any visitors to the house on this day? Over here. Bob, if you would. Pat, they're coming down. Oh, they already have a packet. Oh, okay. Well, somebody got to you early. That's good. Okay. <laughs> Enthusiastic greeters, that's a good thing. Anybody else? Oh, fine. We welcome you in the name of Christ and hope you, uh, your time here encourages your life and your spirit. Our Faith Renewal classes begin on Sunday, February 26th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I'm doing those classes all the Sundays in Lent uh, as a way of leading up to uh, the, Holy, the Holy, Holy Week and Easter. Uh, this is for those who might be considering becoming members of the LCOS Faith Family, but it's also for those who just want to simply review a little bit about who we are and why we believe the things we do and so forth. So I promise you it will not be a talking head. Uh, it will be mostly conversation about uh, this is what we understand Scripture to say, and this is why, uh, why, we, why we believe that. So uh, please come and be part of that. If you have any questions, uh, please ask. I'm glad to, since I'll be the guy teaching it, I'm, I'm glad to tell you that. Uh, there's always lots of sign-up sheets in the narthex. Uh, maybe sometimes it feels like too many. But here's the good news. The good news is there are a stunning array of gifts in this congregation. Here's the bad news. They're not all being used. So sign-up sheets are a way by which we try to encourage you to seriously and honestly reflect on who you are and what gifts you may have and how they might be used for our ministry together as we reach out in the name of Christ. So for those who are of a cooking bent, if you will, uh, we're doing uh, Lent and midweek services on Wednesdays all during Lent, which will be followed by a, uh, a, a lunch. And so for those who might be willing to make uh, soup or dessert for those, uh, those sign-up sheets are there. If you want to be part, uh, more part of the worship life at LCOS, if you want to be part of the people up here, uh, there are sign-up sheets for that too. Crucifers, ushers especially, if you want to practice the gift of hospitality. Uh, we're being blessed by having lots of visitors, so 
Uh, we need to always be open to welcoming the stranger among us. And also, I'd like to consider uh, becoming part of our ESL ministry. This is a primary uh, ministry that is part of LCOS. So English is the second language. Believe it or not, after 20 years, we're the only group in the area who does this. So in the fall, we had 87 students signed up. And uh, now for the winter, we have an additional 50 students <clears throat> signed up. Now what's fascinating to me is probably 40 or 50 of those students are coming from Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, all places you would not think of when you think of Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. So uh, there's lots of ways in which you might be able to be involved in this ministry. If you have questions, uh, see me, or I'll be glad to direct you to the person who's in charge of it right now. Her name is Denise, um, and to help you to begin to realize how you might be reassured gifts uh, for those who are now among us. I think that's it. I'm looking at Jerry. I always look over here. <laughs> My fail safe over here. So did I miss anything? I don't think so. So if you are able, I invite you to rise as we begin our worship of the very gracious God. <clears throat> as always, we make our strong beginning in the name of God the Father, and of God the Son, and of God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we pray together. O oh God, strength of all who hope in you, because we are weak mortals, we accomplish nothing good without you. Help us to see and understand the things we ought to do, and give us grace and power to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We continue with the opening songs. <coughs>
Uh, let us come before God with uh, our sins and our sinfulness. So let's take a moment of silence to reflect on how we have lived our lives in the past several days. given his only son to die for us and for his sake he gives us new life <coughs> our sins are permanently removed from us we are forgiven and restored as those who are the dearly loved children of God journeying through life with him and towards him the Spirit the Spirit Please be seated. 
The lessons appointed to be read on this, the sixth Sunday in the season of Epiphany, take us back to the Old Testament and to the book of Deuteronomy. And when you read the book of Deuteronomy, understand this is in a real sense Moses' farewell address. Uh, they finally got out of Egypt. Moses leads them through 40 years of the wilderness wanderings. And now finally they are on the shore looking across the Jordan River about to enter the land of Canaan which is the promised land, the land that was promised to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses knows already that he's not going to be able to travel with them into the new land. He will die on this side of the Jordan. And a guy by the name of Joshua will take over as the leader of Israel. But before he goes, Moses wants them to remember, surely, how they got there, why they are there, and in whose name they serve and encouraging them to remember, they'll never forget, you are the covenanted, set apart children of God, and you are here for a reason and for a purpose. Don't be distracted by lots of other stuff, because if you are, that's where trouble begins. In its own way, even though several centuries apart, these are good words for us to remember as well. Deuteronomy 30, beginning at verse 15. <laughs> See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience with him, and to see his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if you hearts turn away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore <clears throat> to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from the pen of St. Paul as he writes the small house church in first century Corinth. And try to imagine all of these little house churches Nobody had ever been Christian before. All of the members, such as they were, were coming from very different backgrounds, very different traditions, and trying to figure out what it meant to believe in Jesus and, and what that meant for life and for living life. And as you might expect, they were drawn to different leaders. They thought, well, this guy has the right stuff. This guy has the right stuff. And Paul takes great pains to remind them, no, <laughs> it's under the cross. It's all different leaders have different gifts. They may be different perspectives, but it all hopefully finally leans back to Jesus and to the cross. Reminding us as well that being a Christian is a lifelong experience of learning. <clears throat> and we grow and we learn through the grace of many different people whom God puts among us. Let us listen to these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and the other says, I follow Apollos. Are you not mere human beings? After all, what is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you come to believe, as the Lord has assigned to, to each task. I planted the seed, and Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded, rewarded according to their own labor. 
for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field and God's building. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to rise if you are able as we listen to the words of the Holy Gospel. <coughs> the Holy Gospel that today is given to us in the witness of St. Matthew, the fifth chapter beginning at the 21st verse. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, if anybody says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And if anyone says, you fool, you'll be in danger of the fire of hell. And therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way. Or your adversary may hand you over to the judge. And the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you pay the last penny. You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. I tell you that anybody who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. Anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, you can make even one hand, hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord. We join our hearts and our voices uh, together in affirming our faith. I believe in the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe in the Father Almighty, who has created all things. I believe in the Son, Jesus, our Redeemer. He gave his life on the cross and he rose again on the third day. He ascended to heaven, and now he sits at the right hand of God the Father. He will come again to judge those living in the dead. Because of his death and resurrection, we live with sure and certain hope until he returns. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. He empowers us to believe and hold on to our sure and certain hope. He is able to stir us and keep us alert until Jesus returns. I also believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the life everlasting. This I believe and confess. You may be seated. We continue with the next song. <clears throat>
God's grace, God's mercy, and God's kind of peace rest deep, deep in your hearts, deep in your minds, this day and always, because of Jesus Christ. The text is the gospel lesson read a few moments ago, so far the text. Whatever became of sin. There was the title of a small book written by the noted psychiatrist Carl Menninger back in 1973. They said they wrote the book because he was fascinated. All the people that came to him for counseling, and they were all wrestling with things that were going wrong in their life and things that were happening to them, and they were all struggling to find answers, all struggling to find peace. And he said none of them ever allowed for the possibility that they were part of the problem. <laughs> none of them ever allowed for the possibility that some personal accountability might help explain a lot of things. It might finally lead them to a better, clearer understanding of who they were and uh, what life was finally all about. If the whole concept of sin and personal accountability was lacking in society in 1973, I would humbly suggest lacking even more today. You go onto the internet, there's a great deal of finger pointing, there's a great deal of accusing, there's a great deal of judging, but I don't see at least a whole lot of personal accountability. I don't see a lot of people saying, you know, uh, it was me, it was my fault, I'm the one. If you even mention the word sin and anybody around you, the first image that comes to mind is of a bony-fingered preacher condemning everybody to hell or living under a burden of guilt they cannot escape from. If you were to ask the average American if they would consider certain people to be sinful, who would they who would they point out? Well, they might suggest the actions of certain politicians, certain professional athletes, certain actors, actresses in Hollywood, but they would never include themselves in that august assembly of broken and sinful people because they probably believe honestly that they are reasonable people leading reasonable lives. Even people who are not religious in any sense of the word probably have a nodding acquaintance with the Ten Commandments. And if you were to show them <clears throat> a copy of the commandments, well, they probably would say, yes, this looks like a very fine guide on how to live life with moral integrity. But then they probably would add quickly, but I haven't broken any of them. All of which is to say that the words of this morning's gospel lesson then are extremely helpful because they clarify that at the end of the day, the commandments are not a nice moral checklist. They really are a stinging indictment. Jesus begins with the fifth commandment. You've heard it said to the people of old, thou shalt not kill. And we all sit here going, okay, got that one. Haven't killed anybody yet. Not yet. Thought about it once or twice, maybe, but I'm still okay. And then Jesus continues, but I say to you, you call your brother a fool, you're in danger of hell. Fool. Reminding us of how powerful our words can be. Words are meant to build up, to affirm, to encourage, to sustain, to comfort. But often, all during the day, our words are just the opposite. What we just said to the person who cut us off on Route 1 on our way to church this morning, <clears throat> or to aging parents, or to unruly children, or to uncaring spouses, or to the co-worker we've lost patience with, our words all day long, 
provide a killing field around us. <clears throat> and the bodies are everywhere. Then Jesus goes on to the sixth commandment. You've heard it said to the people of all, thou shalt not commit adultery. And again, we think, okay, I got this one. I haven't done that yet. But then Jesus says, I say to you, if you look at a woman or a man lustfully, you've already committed adultery with them in your heart. The shapely body on the towel at the beach. The image on the internet. The cute student who's in the same classroom we are that we can't take our eyes off of. The person at the bar or the restaurant who seems attractive. As human beings, we are always looking and part of it is just admiring God's handiwork, which is fine. <laughs> but the thing about us is that soon enough, we begin to think thoughts that surprise and even embarrass us. Jesus is, in using the examples of just two of the Ten Commandments, really saying to us, you break them every day. If you don't do it overtly, you're certainly doing with your words and with your thoughts, because that's who you are as a human being. So instead of affirming us, saying, you know what, you're doing just fine, Jesus is really holding up a mirror, saying, this is what you really look like. The word for sin in Greek is harmatia. I think you've heard me say that word before. I, it's not important that you remember the Greek word. It's important that you remember what the word means. The word hamartia means to miss the target. To be less of the creature God intended us to be. God intended us to be living in concordia, harmony with each other, with ourselves, and with the planet that sustains our life for the very brief moment that we are here. Sin, whether in word or thought or deed, is all the stuff that drives a wedge between that. It's all the stuff that we do or think or say, and each day that cripples the harmony that was God's intent. And nobody is freed from this indictment. It's an old seminary joke, so there's a pastor preaching a very fiery sermon. Well, that might not happen in a Lutheran church. <laughs> but the pastor says, this morning I really want to talk about the sin of greed. And the congregation responds out loud. That would never happen in a Lutheran church, saying, yeah, pastor, preach it, preach it. Good one, that's a bad, that's a bad sin, preach it. The pastor preaches on that for a while and says, today I'd also like to talk about the sin of lust. And the congregation responds enthusiastically saying, yeah, preach it, preach it. Yep, that's right, that's a bad one. Goes on for a while and then the pastor says, and today I also want to talk about the sin of gossip. Dead silence. <laughs> and one person leans to another and says, huh, he just stopped preaching and started meddling. <laughs> If the words of this morning's gospel lesson make you vaguely uncomfortable, they should. Because Jesus is meddling. Jesus is reminding every one of us that we do not have our spiritual act together. And that we are not nearly as holy as we'd like to think we are. Or as we would like others to believe we are. That we really are broken inside more than we want to admit. And that we really need some help from the outside, more than we're willing to admit. And nobody is freed from the indictment. Not people who have been in church since they were in utero. Not good Lutherans who have memorized all the hymns in the Lutheran hymnal. Not the first time visitor. 
not the clown who stands in front of you, and not even St. Paul. When you think of somebody who's got their act together spiritually, well, we start thinking maybe St. Paul. There's a guy who kind of always oars on. He kind of had his act together. He was always sure about the gospel, always sure about the intent. Here's what Paul writes in Romans chapter 7. I know the good I'm supposed to do, and I don't do it. I know the things that are bad to do, and that's what I wind up doing. Wretched man that I am, who will save me? And then he says, thanks be to God who gives me the victory through Jesus Christ. Paul was a quintessential Jew. He had it all together. He obeyed the law. He obeyed the commandments. He did it, everything. And yet finally it would be a moment of conversion in Acts chapter 9 where he literally got knocked on his tush. Where he finally realized that he was nothing. And that all that he thought he was counted for nothing. And he turned his life around and became an evangelist for Christ and probably the most ambitious evangelist the faith has ever seen. If these words of Jesus are the first word, if they're a word of indictment, thank God they are not the last word because Christians are not called to live with a load of guilt. We are not called to spend our life wondering about what happens when we die and if we're going to get there. We are not called to live in fear and to feel like we're trapped in something we can't get out of and that Jesus here is really just playing a gotcha. Now the whole purpose of these words is to help us realize that we are sinners in need of a savior. And thanks be to God that has been provided. So one of the cashiers in a local store here is a practicing Christian and uh, he sees my collar all the time so he knows what I'm about. And every time I'm in the store, every time he sees me, he wants to talk to me about matters of faith. And I'm always willing to oblige. So I see him the other day, and he said, Father! <laughs> and that's not a time to get into a protracted discussion about whether it's ecclesiastical <laughs> vocabulary, and I'm not really a father, although I am physically, but, you know, any of that. And I've been called worse, so father it is. <laughs> He says, Father, I want you to know, I keep all the commandments so that when I die, God knows I'm supposed to be on the good side. I caught my breath and I responded very quietly saying, good brother, it isn't what you do that matters at all. It's what God has already done for you in Christ a long time ago that makes the difference. It's the cross that makes sure that whatever you have done or whatever you have failed to do is washed away. God knows exactly who you are, what you're about, and God says, I choose to love you anyway. So I sit quietly, willing to live in humility and with a grateful heart because the gift that has been given to you. He just stood there for a while, and I hope I gave him something to think about. I guess there'll be more conversations the next time I see him. The words here today are hard to read. And if I'm honest, they're hard to preach about. I would much rather come in here like some kind of a great cheerleader and just say, you know what, you're all doing fine. Let's sing Kumbaya and leave just feeling really good about who we are. I can't do that. I just can't. There are times when the words of Jesus press in on us hard in ways that we don't even want to think about. But if you don't realize how broken you are inside 
and you don't realize that you don't have it all together, then why would you need a Savior? Where would Jesus fit into your life at all? Except as just some good moral teacher. But he's far more than that. We are sinners in need of a Savior, and thanks be to God that's been provided. Sin will always be around and inside of us because it's part of who we are as human beings. It's a very primal thing. That is the truth and the certainty. But God's grace for us in Christ is always around and available to us as well. That is a greater truth and a greater certainty. May we learn to accept the first truth so that we can rejoice and be grateful in the second. Let the people of God say, Amen. I invite you to rise for prayers if you are able. and pray. Out of grace and mercy, we praise you for the gift of another day, for one more chance at life. We pray that you would be upon us in this day through your empowering spirit and grace. Help us again to look into the mirror and not always like what we see. Help us to realize that we need some help on the outside for us, for who we are in the inside. Help us, Lord, to be honest in who we are and what we're about so that indeed our eyes are drawn to the cross and toward your forgiving love. And may then we live out that love with gratitude and with humility and grace. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray, O oh God, for this day. We pray for the church throughout the world, especially where it's being persecuted. We pray, O oh God, that you would give to our brothers and sisters who are struggling a measure of conviction, a measure of certainty, a measure of courage so that in their unyielding witness, others may be drawn to your love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for every member of this congregation as they find themselves out in the world beyond these doors. We pray that you would help them to always remember that they are indeed to be agents of reconciliation and grace to a very broken and to a very hurting society. Open our eyes, O oh God, to all that is out there and help us to, through our words and actions, find ways of offering your compassion and your love. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We pray for our country and for all of the restlessness that it's going through, all the people who take sides and who point fingers and who judge. We pray, O oh God, that your spirit would fall upon us, and especially upon those whom we have elected to serve. We pray, O oh God, that you would give them wisdom, discernment, and the uh, determination to work together for the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We pray for the world that lies beyond these doors, far beyond our understanding. We pray especially for the places where there is conflict, again in Jerusalem, in what is supposed to be the Holy Land, in Somalia. We pray especially for those who are struggling to recover from the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. It is such an unfathomable thing for us to realize. When they talk about 30,000 people died. We pray, O oh God, for those who remain. We pray for those who are still being pulled out of the wreckage. We pray for the rescue teams, that you would give them courage and determination. We pray that all of the efforts that are being made to offer assistance may be seen as signs of your grace and of your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray, O oh God, for many people who are hurting and struggling. We pray in our own congregation, especially for those who are recovering from surgery and who are able to be with us again. We also pray for those who are, um, who are marking milestones on this day. And for birthdays, we pray especially for Kathy, Kathy. Bernie, Bernie. Georgette, Georgette, Ken, Ken. Larry. Larry. As they approach that milestone and as they look back at what has been, give them courage and grace and humor enough for whatever lies ahead. 
and help them, Lord, in the days that are before them. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Each one of us, O oh God, comes into this place with other people on our minds and on our hearts this day. And so each one of us now in our own way says their names out loud, knowing that you hear and that in your time and way you will answer. So on this day we also pray for In whatever place these people whom we love are, may your grace find them, and may they know of our love for them as well. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Father, O oh God, as we come to the altar this day, again be with us as we participate and receive your gracious promise in a most gracious gift, the holy mystery you left for us over 20 centuries ago, of bread and wine, body and blood. In this mystery, come to us where we need to be found. Find us, heal us, help us, and strengthen us, Lord, that we leave this place determined even more to be your disciples, your followers in the world in which we find ourselves. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we join together as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. If you listened as the gospel was being read this morning, you heard Jesus say these words, if when you are bringing your gift to the altar, you suddenly remember you have a grievance against your brother or sister, leave your gift where it is. First go and make peace with your brother and sister, and only then come back and offer your gift. The early Christians seized on those words and began the practice of sharing the peace. So we continue that practice even today. We are still trying to crawl out from under the rock of COVID. So uh, when we share the peace, you can do that any way you want. It can be a fist bump, it can be a V sign, it can be uh, a polite smile, or it can be a full blown hug. Uh, you've got plenty of time. The game doesn't start for six hours. <laughs> uh, you know, you can, so the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share that peace with each other. that, again, uh, trying to reclaim some of what we did before, you have the option of intinction when you come up forward. You will receive a wafer, and you, if you wish, you can then intink that into the chalice directly and receive communion that way. Otherwise, of course, the small cups and individual cups are here as they always have been. The second thing is when I consecrate the elements, you might notice there is an additional cruet up here. This is the consecrated, this is the wine that will be consecrated. One of the elders will take it away from here 
because that is what gets put into the communion kits that are taken to the shuttles so that we remember our brothers and sisters who are not able to be with us today and that they can still receive and participate in this uh, great Eucharistic feast. So, so with that, we continue. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way also he took a cup of the wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, a, take and drink of this, all of you. This cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin, do this for the remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
may indeed the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, evermore strengthen and preserve you in faith until your life everlasting be part in his peace and for his service. Amen. 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 And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be in abide with you now and always.